Well, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you guys are all logged in and comfortable uh, and can hear me, of course. Uh, my name is Rachel Bestuda. I'm the Tri-State Fair Project Director. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I think we'll probably have a few more people um, floating in as, as we get running here, but I don't want to delay um, and get us off uh, behind from the get-go. So just a little housekeeping to start. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be posted for further reference on our website um, after today's webinar. Uh, I want to reassure everybody that the breakout rooms will not be recorded, uh, so you certainly don't have to worry about what you say in those um, being you know, spread to everybody else who listens to the recording hereafter. Um, in an effort to make sure we are decreasing any unnecessary background noise, um, I'm going to ask you all to mute yourselves uh, now and uh, remain muted unless we are in the breakout sessions. And then, of course, um, we would love to have you unmute and, and talk and interact with everybody else. So um, please mute yourselves now. Uh, and then in terms of video, we encourage you to certainly use your video uh, during our breakout sessions today. Uh, you don't have to use your video now um, during the presentations. It may um, be easier for you to focus just on the presenter themselves uh, without having to worry about everybody else's video running alongside. But of course, that's, that's up to you as well. Um, if you don't already have the chat uh, box pulled up on your screen, it should be somewhere towards the bottom of the right-hand side of your screen. Please do so now. If you don't see it there, go down and hover kind of where my mouth is. Um, you should see a little button that says chat. Go ahead and click on that and it should populate on your screen. Uh, that is where we'll be using, um, interacting with each other throughout in terms of communication today. Uh, so that is where we'll post some links for our, um, our pre and post evaluation and then also um, where you can enter any questions in. I see some things coming in now. Uh, so certainly um, it seems like everybody's kind of up and running on that side of things. Those questions will make sure get answered either during the breakout session uh, or if not during the uh, wrap up today. And then of course, if for some reason we don't get to all of the questions that we have, we'll definitely make sure that um, we get you pointed in the right direction to somebody who can help you um, after the webinar. Just a little background information about the project. This webinar is part of the Tri-State Fair Professional Development Project, uh, which is funded through the USDA and Northeast Fair. And it's a collaborative project among the universities of Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We are in our first year of a new three-year grant uh, project. And again, we're focusing our efforts on pasture management and infrastructure as we have in the past um, and as it relates to sustainable livestock production. This year, we're offering a webinar series. Um, and the series is obviously, as you guys have seen, a uh, creation of a simple grazing plan. Um, today's webinar is the first of four webinars. And uh, it will consist of several presentations and then also breakout rooms uh, where we're going to allow for small group interaction uh, and you guys can get some questions answered and bounce some ideas off of each other, um, et cetera. So if you haven't already, we did email out some handouts and exercises that we'll be going through today during the presentation. Uh, so go ahead and make sure if you can print those out. If not, at least have them up so that you can work on them as we're in our breakout room. Um, we'll automatically be moving people in and out of the breakout room. So there's no need for you to do anything. As long as you stay connected, you'll be moved around to where you're supposed to be. <clears throat> And then let me just get down to uh, some more information here. So uh, we are again offering a certificate of participation. Um, in order to be eligible for that, that certificate, a participant needs to attend all four grazing plan webinars, which uh, the first one is, is today. And um, the second um, eligibility piece is that a participant will also need to do at least one of the following either attend one of our 2021 summer field training webinars or have a one-on-one follow-up conversation about your participation in the program 
what you have learned or what additional guidance you would like with um, one of our program staff. So that would be either myself, Gene King, or Sam Corcoran. Uh, all of our contact information is on our project website, and that website link is right there on the screen uh, right now. I'm happy to mention that this year we're collaborating with the New England Grazing Network. Um, the network is made possible by the Sear Tree Foundation, which is an organization that is committed to regenerative grazing. Sam Corcoran, who is from UMass, is the project coordinator for that and she'll be a part of each of these four webinars. Um, please feel free to contact her at any time if you have any further questions or you'd like more individualized guidance uh, from any of the topics that we discussed throughout the webinars. She would be happy to help. Her contact information is up on the screen right now and again also on our project website, um, which is the meatsystems.ucon.edu. I'm going to hand it over real quick to uh, Joe Benelli, who is the Connecticut State SARE coordinator and also the PI on our Tri-State SARE project. He's just going to give us a little rundown of some of the grants that are available through Northeast SARE. So, Joe, go ahead and take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Rachel, can Yes, I can. Good. Well, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to our, our Tri-State tri project. Uh, I'm, an uh, I'm an extension educator here with UConn, and I've been working on the, I'm the, also the Northeast SARE, uh, you know, coordinator uh, for Connecticut. This sheet will give you a, a quick overview of some of the grant programs uh, that are offered uh, through the Northeast SARE. I also want to mention that Northeast SARE also has a lot of other resources that you might find helpful and interesting as well, too. Uh, all the grant projects are, are, are uh, on the website, uh, as well as other resources that have been developed by Northeast SARE as well as also national SARE uh, as well too. I'd like to mention very quickly, there is two grants there that uh, might be helpful. The first one is the farmer grant. That's up to $15,000 grants. That's not non-matching. Uh, and that's for farmers that are basically looking to test an idea with regard to production, marketing, and other farm issues. Um, and that, that will be coming up a uh, start date. Uh, well, for the, that application will be late fall. The other one that might be of interest for, for service providers is our partnership grant. Uh, those grants are up to up to thirty thousand uh, dollars uh, this year, uh, and and that application I believe is coming uh, available on March one, with the due date of, of four thirteen. Uh, the requirement there uh, is that uh, you have a farmer collaborator that's working with you on an, on an idea you have for research uh, as well too. Uh, so again, I'll hand the, those are two highlights of of that worksheet. Uh, any questions? Uh, feel free to let me know. And uh, back to you, Rachel. Have a good back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Joe. Um, just another point to this um, worksheet a document is also up on our website uh, for further viewing. And there's a lot of active links there that once you click on them, they'll take you right to the Northeast Fair website for some more information. Uh, so certainly reach out at any time if you have further questions as well. Um, the next thing that we'll jump into before I introduce the speakers is our um, evaluation. We are doing a pre and post evaluation um, again this year as we have um, either in person or our webinars last year. Those of you who were with us last year um, probably remember the use of Slido. Uh, we are using that again. So certainly go ahead and uh, pull up the chat. There is a link that Mackenzie just posted. Um, if you click on that link, it will take you to uh, another uh, external site. That should have a series of questions that you can answer. And then as you scroll to the bottom, um, you should see a little section there that um, a little green button that allows you to send in your answers. So I'm going to pause for just a moment now and let you click on that link and take the pre-evaluation questions.
All right, so I'm imagining that most of us are probably through those questions. Um, if you're not, certainly feel free to continue through them and hit the submit button. Um, I, in the meantime, I'm going to just introduce our speakers. Uh, before I do that, though, I will mention that if for some reason uh, you can't find the link or you didn't get the link, um, we are going to be sending out that link again afterwards for everybody who was on the webinar today. So in the event that you can't get there or you can't find where you're supposed to go, um, just hang tight and after the webinar today, uh, later on this afternoon, we'll send that out again and you can answer it, um, you know, through that link. <clears throat> All right, our first speaker today is Jennifer Colby. She has been part of the UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture's ASHER program for 16 years, coordinating it for the last 10. Jen has served as the Vermont Grazing and Livestock Conference organizer and developed a long-standing partnership with the Vermont Grass Farmers Association. And the UVM team providing technical assistance for the Long Island South Watershed and was the co-chair of the Vermont Farm to Plate Network's production and processing working group. She is also an advisor for the Randolph Technical Career Center uh, Agriculture Program. Jen has taught part-time at Sterling College and Vermont Technical College, and she has operated a diversified meat livestock farm since 2000. Our second speaker today is Damon Mee. He grew up on a farm in New Hampshire, earning his MS at Michigan State University. He then worked for UNH Extension on the Dairy, Livestock, and Forage Crops team. In 2016, he started at NRCS as a New Hampshire State Grazing Specialist. In this role, he supports NRCS staff and farmers statewide to further their understanding of their animal and forage management. He is also on the New Hampshire FPAC Beginner Farmer team and is on the New Hampshire NRCS Organic State, or is the New Hampshire NRCS Organic State contact. Damon is an active member of the Granite State Grazers Board since 2013 and is on the executive committee for the Northeast Pasture Consortium. And lastly today, Susan Perry is our third speaker. She is the Pennsylvania State Grassland Conservationist for NRCS. She develops technical guidance for conservation standards related to agriculture and grazing, implements training programs for NRCS staff and service providers, and assists in the coordination of the Pennsylvania Grazing Lands Coalition. Susan has a degree in environmental resources from California University of Pennsylvania and a degree in public administration with a minor in environmental policy from Penn State Harrisburg. She's a volunteer member of several community-based organizations and emphasizes stewardship of the natural resource base in both her career and personal activities. So with that, uh, just give us a minute to switch over. We're gonna start with Jen and she will kick us off for today. Good morning, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. Always a good question. There we go. Am I sharing the full screen? Um, it's still on your part. Oh, looks great. Looks good. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so I, I get, uh, I get to kick everybody off and um, uh, pass it on to my, um, to my brilliant colleagues. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Um, why would you even want to develop a grazing plan? That's, that's um, a question that we get from a lot of different folks. Um, a lot of different farmers. Why do I actually want to write this stuff down? Why do I even want to plan? What's the use of a plan um, if I do or don't use it? And and the answer to that is that plans are useless, but planning itself is indispensable. So the conversation with farmers all the time that I have is, um, you know, I have a plan in my head. I don't need to write it down. Um, I know what I'm doing this week. I know what I've got I've got going on today. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have a plan that's going to be any effect, effective any longer than today or this week um, or even in a few weeks. And so planning ahead means we actually have to look forward a little bit. And as soon as we start to put a plan into action, it might need to be changed as early as the first day. Um, no plan survives contact with the, the enemy, first contact with the enemy. Um, so why would we even bother to plan? Because the act of planning 
is what makes us think about what we want, think about what we have to work with, and think about how we might want to get from one place to another. And so, and why would we do it in a group setting like this? That's another question. Um, and it's because the act of planning and sharing what we're doing and what we're thinking of will help jog the minds of other people and to think about things that they might take for granted or you might take for granted, or they might think differently than you do um, about what you see every day. That's the thing, the answer, the answer for lots of things is in a team, is in a group of people going back and forth. So the hope is that through this process, um, we're gonna be able to help each other go through some of these pieces and also help us think in different ways if, if we can, if we're successful at that. So if we're gonna plan, why develop an actual grazing plan? Well, the interesting thing about a grazing plan is not to put too much pressure on everyone, but it is the ability to be a life driver. It has in the best possible way. Um, lots of times the grazing plan can be, be something that's just um, put together and put on a shelf, and um, but it doesn't have to be that. and. If you work through some of these questions, as you go, as you go in the next few weeks, is this off, a, amazing, powerful opportunity to set up the life that you want. Um, and in farming, we don't always do that. And so grazing, setting up a grazing plan is actually an opportunity to ask those things where, where you wanna live, how you wanna live, how you wanna make money, and be able to do all of that while treating land and animals really, really well. So, just a few live questions there, nothing, nothing too big. So the, piece, so the question is, what are the pieces of a grazing plan? And we're gonna go over those. So what we're focusing on in this series is um, a sim the simple approach uh, to getting you some good basics to get started with the grazing plan. Um, so this series is gonna focus on goals and assets this week forage and land, um, and the next one, we're gonna do system design, and then we're gonna do some refinement in the last in the last session. And the idea is that you'll be able to step away from this at the end of it um, with something that is a workable plan, just to get you started. We all have to get started someplace, um, and this is the idea of this is that we're going to be able to get you something that is workable um, and operational right away. Now, that said, if you wanna go deep dive into this in the future, um, it can go complex. We can get into labor, we can get into capital investment, um, looking at whether your markets really fit the grazing system that you have or your grazing system fits the markets you have, whether you wanna change those. There's a whole bunch of animal behavior, there's observational skills around the improvements um, or, or decline that you might see and some conditions, um, honing in on profitability. There's a great long list that you can dive into if you want to. But today, <laughs> we're just gonna be working on the start. And the start is really about some goals and what you have to work with. And so there are different goals. You could have biodiversity be goals. You could certainly have uh, turning the pasture on the left into the pasture on the right. In case anyone's wondering, both are pastures on my, on my farm. They, they exist side by side. Um, or it could be that your goal is to spend more time with your family and you can use uh, grazing planning to do that. This is an actual farmer who plants in vacations um, in, in a way that sort of is a, is a good example for the rest of us to do that. Uh, I will admit I'm not always awesome at doing that. But this is an opportunity to do that if it's a desired goal to spend more time with our family. And then when we think about um, inventory and assets, a couple of things that we're gonna be thinking about, of course, because we are livestock farms doing grazing doing grazing systems is animals as uh, one of the major tools that we have um, when we think about inventory and the assets that we have and how they can work to our advantage or our disadvantage, which manure and animal impact is definitely one of those things. And then also um, there's a lot of, of build equipment, there's land, um, there's infrastructure that we'll also be thinking about in terms of inventory. So that's just a little bit of broad strokes for that. Um, overall, our, we have goals for, for you too through the course of this whole um, series. And we really wanna be able to support folks who are new to grazing, folks who are um, really intensifying their grazing, folks who've done this for years, folks who haven't done this at all. Because um, those of us who have been doing this for a while, 
there's never an end to to what we learn and what what we can learn um, and how we can refine or change our systems. And so we want to really be able to support folks who are at every single level and entry point of this. And we know that there are service providing folks as well um, who want to who want to be um, refining what they do in terms of working with farmers. So we want to help you you guys as well be able to do a better job to help everyone. And then we really want to have you be able to take away these really manageable pieces to build a plan. That great long list is a great long list and it's really overwhelming and a little intimidating actually. So we really wanted to chunk it into some manageable pieces for you that if you are doing your homework along the way, um, at, the, at the end of the series, you'll feel like you have something that you can really move forward on. We also really wanted to make sure that you all connect with each other because one of the biggest assets um, across the whole region is farmer to farmer connection and human to human connection and being able to share experiences, look at things with a different set of eyes. Um, that's how we grow the whole agricultural system um, more broadly and, and keep it strong is we want to keep you all connected to each other. Um, we're also, we're all here to, um, to most of us are participating in, in all um, or most of the, the series, even if we're not presenters, because we want to be continuing resources for you. So we just want to keep those doors, those channels of communication open and so that you all know that we're here for you through the whole series and beyond. And then ultimately, we really want you to, to feel like you can grade successfully. It doesn't mean that you'll do it um, you know, perfectly the first time. In fact, um, it's actually, a, you learn a lot more when, when you have um, things that don't go well. So, but we want to empower you to have the information to get started, to try to, to um, figure out ways to look at what you're, look at what you're seeing with different grazing eyes um, and think about ways to, to improve upon it and do it differently, decide which things you're doing well. Ultimately, a good grazing system is a really, really flexible system and it's supposed to serve you and your goals. So, with that, speaking of goals, um, I'm going to turn it over to Damon and he's going to get us started on the goal setting side. Thank you, Jen. Uh, what, a, what a great start there. Um, I, uh, I will present my screen here uh, in just a little bit, but I figured I'd just start by, by talking with you folks um, a little bit about, about this, um, this section and, and goal setting. Um, and um, so, so the way we're going to do this is I'm going to talk a little bit about setting goals and the worksheet that you may have looked at um, ahead of time that was sent along. Um, and then we're going to break out into smaller groups and have uh, a little bit of time, maybe five to ten minutes, to work on developing some goals and um, and uh, of of your own. Write them down, and then each group is going to have a someone that will um, help facilitate some sharing of those goals within the groups. Uh, afterwards, and um, then we'll come back and do just kind of a final few minute wrap up. Um, so, as as Jen, <laughs> Jen, you really you really set me up nicely here, so I appreciate it. So, um, you know the. Uh, these grazing plans are really important and and when when Jen mentioned that often we sometimes or sometimes we see these grazing plans sit on shelves after they've been written by someone else um, you know and and I think a lot of reasons for that is because the goals uh, are, the the producers goals are not met um, so uh, by by that plan they don't fit with the producers goals so when when we talk about developing these grazing plans, it's really important to upfront kind of think about how, just really what direction you want to be heading, and that way your grazing plan can fit what you want to do and propel you in the direction that you want to go. Um, and then for the service providers here that are, are advising farmers, I, I hope through this presentation um, or, or this kind of work session as well, you can kind of be thinking about maybe what sort of questions you would ask producers that you work with to get at understanding some of their goals so that you can be on the same page with them as, as you're working through um, whatever process you are with, with them, providing um, 
you know, good information or if you're with NRCS through the planning process or, or anything like that. So, um, yeah, if you're a service provider, definitely kind of have, have that in mind as we're, we're going through this whole, whole portion. Um, so I, I forgot to mention, I just want to um, go back to the discussion about the breakout sessions. Um, so while you're working on, um, the, you know, the five to 10 minutes of working on your plans, there, there will be some dead air on, on this uh, presentation and, and that's okay. Um, sometimes dead air can be a little bit awkward, but you know, it, that's okay. And then the breakout session leaders are, are there to answer any questions if you're, if you're kind of stuck. Um, then uh, that they're able to, that they'll be able to kind of help move you along uh, toward filling out these, uh, this, this forum. So I, I think Jen kind of touched on it, so I'll only briefly mention it. You know, we, we it, it's important to set goals, uh, kind of just like the planning process, you know, to, to know where we're going. You know, going through that process of, of um, setting goals helps you think through where you want to be, what you want to do. And um, so, so it's, it is, it is quite important. And um, why is it important for grazing is, you know, grazing is, it, or it can be a very complex system. Um, you know, some, some systems are just, you know, uh, set the animals out there and then, you know, come, come find them a little bit later in, in the fall um, or, or, you know, but if if you're actively managing your systems to maximize your your ecosystem, really, um, it, it can be a pretty complex system. So having goals to help focus in on how you want to manage that system um, is is really um, really helpful in in reaching the points that you want to want to get to. And as Jen mentioned as well, you know, the, the, the whole point of sharing in the breakout sessions is um, I, I, I do find, so I've run a number of grazing plan workshops um, before, and I, I do find that it's one thing to write down plans, and, and they don't have to be perfect. It's, you, we're just kind of running through this exercise. Um, but, uh, you know, it, just writing them down is one thing. If you have to write, th think them, think about them enough, and write it down, and then be ready to be able to describe them, um, that kind of gets you to a, a little bit further along in the process of really kind of understanding what your goals are, because you have to try and explain it to to other people. Um, so that's that's the whole point of of kind of sharing. Plus. Um, as Jen mentioned, that it can kind of build community and other people's goals can inspire you as well. So um, that I, I think that's, you know, many, many good reasons um, to to share our goals. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to briefly go over this uh, document here. And my screen should be sharing. Can just someone confirm that you can see? Yep, looks, looks good. good. Per perfect. Um, great. So this is a, a great form. Um, uh, so Ben Bartlett, um, he was someone out at Michigan State um, for in extension for a number of years. He put together this form. He was really steeped in holistic management, um, but then kind of developed this out of it. So, so there are many, many um, kind of common threads with holistic management in in this. Uh, but I just like I like the simplicity of of this sheet. So, what I want to do is just kind of go through how how to fill this out, and then I have some some examples that I can briefly go through with you. Um, so, so. Really, it, you know, you want to step through this from top to bottom and s start with your long-term goals. So, um, you know, these these are kind of the big picture. Where do you want to be heading? Um, you know, when you manage, when you are um, imagining your your system in the future, and um, so the uh, you know th that is. 
Uh, sorry, some <laughs> people are requesting. So, so um, you will. Ha I, I'm getting a number of requests to annotate this, um, and so you will have you will have a chance to work on it um, uh, here in, in just a moment. Um, but uh, so, um, yeah. So, so the, these long-term goals are uh, broken into quality of life, profitability, and and what your legacy is. What what do you want that what do you want your legacy when someone comes to look at the land or your operation? What does th that legacy look like that you want to leave leave behind? Um, and and so you know those those are quite big, lofty ideas. Um, and and I, I should step back and say you know these goals can be you know for just segments of your operation or for the whole operation. But I would recommend maybe starting this process with with maybe a segment of your of your operation so that um, you know so that you can it's a little bit more manageable. Um, but if you want to do it for your whole operation, that that is fine as well. So once you have your long term goals identified, outlined, um, then you hone it in think with those goals in mind you think about okay this what what am i going to do this year what do i want to accomplish this year um and, and then you know, identify those then the strategy is um what you're actually going to do to get yourself towards what you want in in the um goals up above and and so you write down your strategy for for what those are then, um, uh, then from that you move down into the tactics, and you talk about okay, so this is what you're doing, the, your strategy, um, but how and when are you going to do it? You put really, um, you, you know, you kind of refine that point on exactly how you're going to accomplish it. Um, and then, and then the action steps here is, you know, plan, execute, monitor, replan, replan, and repeat. Um, like, like Jen said, that great quote. You know, um, I'm gonna mess it up, but you know, the the plan is actually useless. It's the planning that is really helpful. So, doing this many iterations of this is is really um, really advisable. Um, so, um, so. To give you a little bit more of a concrete uh, example, I just kind of filled these in with some, um, you know, just some example goals. So, you know, quality of life, uh, to have a grazing system set up to allow for some flexibility of personal life. So uh, that picture that Jen shared of uh, the producer who plans in uh, vacation time. Um, you know, if that's that's what you want, you can you can uh, you can put that in here as as one of your goals for quality of life. Um, uh, profitability, you know, on average, I would like to profit two hundred and fifty dollars per animal per season. You know, I, I just <laughs> picked a random number there, so uh, you know that's not really based on anything necessarily. Um, and then legacy, I want a system to improve the quality of the soil and forages resulting in increasing production and profitability, which I can pass on to my kids. So, so that, that's, like I said, that's the really big picture. Um, and then we drill down a little bit into what, what's going to happen this year. So this year I want to develop a grazing system, grazing system plan to increase the yearly produ productivity of my pastures. Um, and then I also want to install infrastructure to make the operation of managed intensive grazing simple and quick. Um, so both of those tie back to, you know, flexibility, um, profitability, and, and improving the soil and, and forages. Um, so, so I've got what I want. Now, what am I going to do? And and I'm going to going to adopt a rotation schedule where the animals are moved daily, with leaving appropriate residue, um, and then complete an NRCS grazing plan to assist in the design and layout of new infrastructure. And and then we get to the how and when. So starting May 15th, I will move animals to new pastures daily, and I will leave at least six inches of residue, and will allow a minimum of a 30-day recovery. Um, I will, and then my goal number two is I will complete my 
uh, grazing plan by early November to be approved by NRCS as a grazing plan that meets their requirements. This will prepare me to uh, apply for infrastructure improvements and prescribed grazing in the funding season that follows. Um, so the raising plan that you're developing now doesn't necessarily have to meet NRCS, um, you know, rigor um, and and our our criteria, but um, it can. Um, so um, it just depends on what level you want to take it to. Um, and then, so with that, I think I will say that we should uh, head on to the breakout sessions and and have folks give it a shot um you know these these can be harder for some than others um and uh so it's it's fine if things <laughs> things are a little challenging but i i i say try and break it into kind of a nice bite-sized piece of of maybe your operation or or something like that and um, and try and make it through the sheet, and and then we can share um, in our breakout groups once once you've completed it. So, well, uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we kind of, uh, <laughs> if you were uh, anything like our group, um, we got whisked back here mid sentence, uh, which <laughs> that's okay. We want to keep on time, but um, uh, apologize for the abruptness if uh, if that was the case. Um, so, um, yeah. So um, I hope I hope you were able to get some good uh, discussion going and have some good thoughts about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing uh, definitely not enough time. It, uh, so when, when I run these courses, it's I, I told my group, you know, there's some people that are done in, you know, two minutes uh, and other people want to take an hour <laughs> to go through this form. So um, definitely it's, it's worth doing um, on your own and doing over and over again. Um, so uh, I, I think you know you can you can refine your goals. You can do one for one portion of your operation, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know do more goals for the other parts of your operation. So um, I, it's a really great exercise, um, and uh, I would I would really encourage uh, doing you know kind of doing an iterative process on it. So. Um, so uh, definitely take some more time to to go through it if you um, you know if you feel like this was really helpful. I hope it was. Um, so and uh, in our group and I think probably in other groups, um, a lot of people mentioned a little bit about what their infrastructure is currently and what they have, what they're raising on their farm and stuff like that. And so so that's a really perfect segue into our discussion on inventory that um, our, my colleague Susan Perry is going to to um, lead. So uh, with that, uh, thank you all for your your work on those goals and I will turn it over to Susan. Well, thank you, kind sir. Um, and I'm going to share, let me just get back to this. I'm going to share a couple of slides, go through those real quick and do the same thing that Damon did. I have a fillable form for everybody for the breakout, but I'm gonna describe the what's in the form and ask a few questions and then uh, break into the breakouts, same as um, Damon did, so we have more time to share. Um, and thank you to my group, it was a fun session. So I'm gonna be talking about inventory. Can everybody, can someone just let me know they can see my screen? Uh, nope, not yet. Oh. Give me a thumbs up when you do. There you go. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll be talking about the key part of developing a grazing plan. So we're setting the stage, as Jen said, we're doing a very uh, basic part of your grazing plan, but it's a really important part. Um, so whether you're a farmer or somebody helping a farmer with their plan for their pasture land, um, some of this will be review for some of you who are a little more advanced. And uh, for some of our service providers, this is how we um, get started with a producer. Um, I would say I'd like this to be interactive, but we'll wait till the end for questions and within our session. So I hope that I'm able to get you started on inventory. And we talked about why we need a plan. And I like this one uh, from Warren Buffett. 
someone's sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree long time ago. So there's long-term goals, there's short-term goals. We've talked about all of that. Um, you know, we, we went through that and that was a great exercise, Damon. Thank you for uh, presenting that. And so we're looking now at infant inventory. What do we already have? What We have to look at what we have so that we know what we need, essentially. So I like to have people get the 10,000 foot view when I first go out. I fly up to the bird's eye view and every single farm, and I would imagine all throughout the Northeast, but this certainly is, uh, this would be a typical dairy farm in my mind. You see the headquarters there, what we call the headquarters or farmstead and all the buildings. You have crop fields where they're growing some of their feeds. So we might assume this is a bit of a conventional operation. And the pasture is usually that piece of land that's close to the stream that has some shade in it maybe and is close to the headquarters if you're a dairy because you need to get the cows out there. You need to kick them out. So, um, and most of our farms have some forested land. Um, north of Pennsylvania and the Chesapeake Bay, it seems a lot of you are, are utilizing your forest area more than we are. We caution the farmers when it comes to using that forest area. So we really want to fly out and get an objective bird's eye view of what we're looking at. Um, and in terms of inventory, we are talking about those human resources that we've just discussed in our goal setting. Um, what's your lifestyle goals? What are your financial goals? And I like to really look at what the current knowledge is. What are you doing now? Do you have people on the farm that are working for you? Do you have family members that work on the farm? Do they work off the farm? And what are your needs in terms of consultants? Do you work with a vet or a nutritionist? Um, and what, what knowledge and skills do you, do you want to attain through this process? Um, there's so many resources out there for that. And then we're gonna discuss land and natural resources. So in terms of resources now, I don't know if, uh, know if you can see, and you know, are you gonna put your kids to work moving cows, you know, kind of is the question. You can see they have a nice setup here. Um, so you wanna, you wanna make this a nice pretty setting for you so that you do have quality life and you don't have to worry about that mucked up field or what your kids are doing. <laughs> you know, so what you have to ask yourself, what, what will I be doing and how do I wanna set this up for my ease of use? Um, as far as human resources, how much experience do you have with pasture management? Some of us are advanced here, some are beginning. Some of the service providers have never really written a grazing plan that are on this call today, and some have done this for years. So uh, we want to kind of get to where uh, we can assess our current knowledge base and look at how what kind of new skills we can learn through this process. Um, does your vet or nutritionist know about pasture management? And if they don't and they're not willing to learn, are you willing to make some changes in the management of your operation and in terms of those consultants you're using? And as I did in my session, um, always remember that you have local resources, whether it's NRCS or your land grant university extension um, that can come out and help you as well, always. And that's all free of charge, I, I like to tell people. We call it voluntary, but it's essentially it's free help. Um, so in terms of land resources, um, a lot of us, and someone had mentioned in my group that they did have their soil tested, they had extension come out. Isn't that great that you do know your, your soil type? The yield, uh, we're really looking at what forages grow on what soils in this type of inventory and what the, what the capability class is. What is the uh, soil, the soil's capability to hold water? You know where there's mucked up fields at all times on your farm. Um, you know the areas that maybe you should stay out of. You know where your streams are. So this is where we look at those physical features from a bird's eye view and really start to put on paper what you have so that we can fill in gaps and in no both knowledge and uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, what kind of hilly land do you have? What is your current land usage? Um, a lot of times uh, pastures end up on what we call D slopes. So they end up on the steepest part of the operation that people can't crop. So what are your conditions there on, this, on the land um, that we can inventory and, and at least know um, how we have to treat those areas? And what natural barriers are there? 
Uh, what roads do you all do you have on the farm? Do you have lanes that are already improved? Do you have hedgerows, streams, and again, those wet areas are very important areas um, to consider when we do an inventory. It's a lot to think about. So, in terms of infrastructure, so those are the physical in features. Now we're going to look at uh, infrastructure type features, what I call infrastructure, which includes your livestock. Um, to me, it's it includes the livestock on your operation. Many of us. I mean, that's the first thing you think about is I have this many, you know, a couple of you have goats and a couple are, are pasturing pigs. And so what's the livestock and what's the behavior of your livestock? Um, do you already have feeding mineral areas set up? Um, do you have existing lanes and walkways? And, and most farmers know the travel lanes or you can almost see the travel lanes that your, your uh, animals are taking if you don't already have them. Um, certainly, um, in, in uh, considering the land access you have, um, we have to consider where the travel lanes are and, and we can help to improve those areas if they do uh, create issues where you have soil erosion and um, um, muddy issues where your, your animals are getting muddy and that sort of thing. So what buildings do you have? Um, do you need to provide shelter or shade? I mean, in the Northeast, there's always an ongoing discussion as if does any animal really need shade? So do we need our trees? Do we need to use that forested area for um, a living barn, if you will? Um, watering is very important. The, 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 um, the access to water, both quantity and quality, um, you know, and I, I think I have that later in it, but you know, the, the animals do love free, free reign of a water system. So that's an important one. And fencing is, is so very important. Um, do you have existing and what's your desired fencing? Um, do you already have your perimeter fencing and do you just need temporary fencing to kind of see how to size your paddocks? Um, and it, most importantly, I think too, is the forage species. If we're talking about a grazing plan and talking about managing our pastures for the forage with livestock, we need to know what's there. And equipment, I don't, I'm not really into equipment, but I did put that on there. <laughs> if you need equipment, what do you have? And what will you need to, to get to your goals that you've developed? Um, so in terms of livestock, I have a lot on this slide, but um, you know, we need to inventory your animal types. Do they travel? Do they uh, pasture together? How many groups do you have? If you're doing dairy, you might have a group of heifers, a, a group of milk cows and a group of bull. I mean, you know, you're probably doing AI, but um, you know, what, what group animal, groups do you have and what is their average weight? Because we will need to use that when Damon and others teach you how to calculate your stocking rates for and size your paddocks. That's very important. Um, how intensive do you want to be in your, in your rotation? So that's another important thing when we consider your livestock. Um, again, I, I mentioned travel lanes and walkways. Feeding areas. Do you have a, a pasture that looks like this with a feeder in the middle of it? Um, you know, and again, we like to work feeding areas into our rotation. If you are feeding on pasture, we like to have movable areas that don't don't beat up the pasture, and you end up with a a concentration area that will not grow uh, forage. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, so shelter and housing. Um, somebody, I forget if it was Damon or Jen, mentioned contingencies. What, where are they when they're not on the pasture? And do you have and do they need shade? And where do they go for calvi calving? So those are things we want to think about while we're inventorying. Oh, you know what I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't change the slide. I'm sorry. So I just recited all of this to you without having you see these wonderful pictures. So this is a picture of a, a friend of mine's farm that uh, we helped to do the laneways there. and. Um, this is what I was talking about with the feeding area. So if you have this, and you know, you never know if you take move this area and reseed, that would be a beautiful pasture. But we want to avoid these these whole pasture feeding areas that won't grow any any uh, forage. So fencing, what is the next thing I wanted to just mention real quick? Um, per livestock type, certain uh, someone in my group mentioned that they have a certain type of fencing, and it just doesn't work, they broke through the fencing. So we wanna consider the livestock. We wanna have an area even of the pasture where we can train livestock. Usually the mamas will train the babies if, if you have the mamas trained. So um, 
what's the condition of your existing fence? Do you have, this is an area that we have a demo area with all the different, different types of fence that you could imagine. Um, this would be for horses. So we wanna consider the livestock and the type of fencing we're using appropriate for that livestock. And uh, there should be local resources you have. Um, and your layout, how many acres do you have? That's really important. And how, what kind of paddock shape makes the most sense for your operation? Um, as far as watering, um, you know, we, we want clean, accessible water. Livestock like to drink. And, uh, you know, our, our metric is 600 to 800 feet to a water source for animals. Um, that way the pastures use more efficiently. Water consumption will increase and production will increase in your animals. Um, so these are the types of questions you wanna ask yourself. And we wanna jot down when we do our inventory, um, how we have those, those areas set up. Um, also with water being distributed and feeding di being distributed well in the pasture, you're gonna get more even distribution of manure and you won't have those areas that become problems. And um, we're big advocates on stream crossings, um, whether you're watering from the stream or you have another off offsite source, uh, we wanna consider those streams and we wanna protect areas that deserve to be protected. Um, and then I, I got into a little bit of pasture inventory methods. So the first method certainly is just walking the pasture and you service providers, that's a, on your first visit, besides getting goals and objectives and hearing what the farmer wants to do, the best way to get uh, observations and to collect data is to walk the pastures with that farmer. They'll point out issues they have, they'll point out wet areas, they'll, they'll talk to you about what they're doing currently and that's the best way to get information um, that we then formulate some recommendations on. Another one, and, and this is one that I try to get farmers to see that collecting data, while it may seem nerdy, it's fun. I mean, with the step point method, you just do a zigzag across your field, you know, whether the size of the field, if it's smaller, you can do five steps. Where you stepped, you count what's there. You do that all across your field and it really does create an inventory of what's actually on your pasture. Right, Damon? I know we, we both were on a, a national team to update our uh, protocols for doing data collection on fields and, and we're actively asking our farmers to do this too. Go ahead, Jason, were you gonna share something? Oh no, it's a, it's a great way to, you know, really get a good idea of what, what's out there. Um, it's, yeah. it's very thorough. Yeah, and I guess the thing that then uh, becomes, and pasture condition scoring is a national pr protocol. We just revised it and released it in January. And we can provide that to you. It's a little more complicated, but the step point worksheet is the basis of answering a, um, answering 10 different indicators of pasture condition, including taking a shovel out and seeing what, you're, what you see under the soil. That's become a very important thing for us in relation to soil health. And I can provide the link. Someone, it looked like someone just asked for the link. We can provide the link and or provide the materials that can be posted on on the uh, um, SARE uh, web, web page. So as far as forages, again, pasture inventory is very important to this forage piece. Um, we need to know what you have out there and what the average yield is. I don't, some people may know that right off the bat, some may not. Um, so we can walk the field with you if you'd like um, and do that if you already know what you have or if you have extension come out and identify. Um, again, you wanna walk that field and, and really get a representative uh, look at what you have out there, whether it's grasses, legumes. I imagine most of you have a lot of cool season grasses and legumes. Um, we have folks that are doing annual uh, forages during the summer season and then and or grazing cover crops um, to get through the summer slump. So you know what, what works and um, if not, you can ask, you know, what grows best in your area based on your soil? Do you need to make changes? Um, is your pasture so beat up that you need to reestablish it? Do you need to, are you converting from crop to pasture or creating new fields? Do you need to renovate? That's what I told someone in our group, pigs are great for that. Let them tear up a field and then renovate that field. Reestablish the, the forage in that field. 
um, and that becomes part of your rotation. And um, another thing is, can you can you man adjust your management to increase your productivity? If it's looking too short, can you break up that pasture so that you can give part of the pasture more rest? And you will see a difference. Um, okay, so uh, looking at forages now, I don't know what you have in the Northeast. This is something that we come up with um, with our uh, land grant university, Penn State, um, years ago, and we still use this. And we actually broke up uh, height in, height removal, and then quality yield. And we have all cool season grass, grass legume, warm season grass, annual crops, and residues. So again, that's based on soil types. Um, you may have that for your area. I would think, um, I mean, I'm happy to share this, but I'm sure um, Damon or others may know of resources that can tell you these things and even provide pictures there. I know Sid uh, Bosworth up there with uh, Jen did a lot of work on developing keys to identifying uh, grasses, broad leaves and legumes. Um, so um, knowing your forage is very important. That's the point I wanted to make here. Um, and then a grazing stick, you know, such an easy thing to look at developing your um, the height and yield for your pasture. And you can even figure out your yield with that grazing stick. And um, I might be creating more work for you guys, but um, I think we're going to go over PCS at one, on one of these. And, um, you know, getting this step point, this is a step point worksheet in Pennsylvania. Like I said, you just walk through and, and make 25 or 50 um, identifications and you get an average of uh, grass and legume in your field or bare surface. So um, the other thing to consider is species production period. Again, this is our chart for Pennsylvania. I don't. I would think it would be pretty similar for uh, many of your states, um, but that's always good to have at hand. And I can provide those resources if you don't have them. Um, again, good pasture management. Rotate those fields. That whole take half, leave half. Um, getting as much, gaining as much knowledge as we can from others. Um, and that is. This is my last and. Again, just another plug for NRCS. We can provide, it's so nice to have a map. And then as you're walking the field, we, I draw on the map and then we can go in and change that according to your grazing plan. So whether you do it this way or a less formal version with a Google map, um, it's really nice to be able to look at what your, what your uh, goals are on paper like this. Um, and that, oops, I forgot to move the slide again. There's our, I'm sorry, there's our species production chart. Oh, there had to be technology issues here, huh? There's the last one I showed with a, a map with just your fields and then with all the infrastructure put in there. Um, so that's the type of thing that we do. And um, again, I'm sorry, I you didn't get to see some of that, but we do need to uh, go into our groups and um, we'll, I'm ready for us to do that now. And we can maybe address questions within the group or Feel free to put in the chat. Okay, and uh, we had a, a, some great conversation. I don't know, do we have time to share or are we moving on to, um, let me look at my time here. We do have a little bit of time. Um, so we had uh, two sessions now where you all broke up and, and shared your goals, shared some of your uh, inventory, hopefully, and uh, kind of developed a, a strategy to fill in your inventory and be ready for the next phase of of this work work uh, shop that you're going to go through, so that at the end you have a, a wonderful grazing plan that can work for you. You know where to find help if you need it, um, and uh, we'll provide links to everything um, that's needed through the Northeast Air Project. Um, and I'll I'm gonna I think my job is to turn it back to Jen to wrap things up for today. Um, Rachel, you want to let me know if I have more time, or I'm, I don't have the agenda right in front of me. At about 11.40, we were going to wrap up and, and head over to Jen. Um, but if, if you had anything else that you wanted to mention quickly, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, have you take a few more minutes. No, no, I think that uh, I, I know our session was lots of fun and everybody shared. There were, it was a mix of service providers and farmers. And I think working together, we can get to a point where uh, you all have a nice product coming out of this workshop. So thank you all very much.
And thanks to my co-presenters. All right, great. So um, thank you, Mackenzie, for, for uh, fixing my my cycle in the chat box. That's what I get for trying to type and talk to Susan at the same time. But certainly, if anybody has any questions, send them over now. I'm going to pass it over to Jen. Uh, Jen's going to do a nice wrap up for us for today and what we're looking at moving forward. And um, we can we probably could have a few minutes for some some time uh, for questions as well. So certainly feel free to uh, send them over. All right, Jen, I'll pass it over to you. Awesome. I will see if I can do this successfully the second time. Awesome. Hopefully you're seeing that. Yep. Looks good. So questions are about what are we going to do next? So the first thing to do is your homework. So these lists that we started today are really just the start. We just wanted to get you going. We just wanted you to spend a couple of minutes. Um, some folks work really well in a group, bopping ideas back and forth, and some folks really need to sit in a quiet place and just really think about um, what they want for goals and what they have for inventory. So. Keep thinking about your things and keep writing them down on your list. So that is this week. And then some of those some of those other questions are like, what additional goals uh, were you were you not have you not thought of yet? Um, are there other animal groups? You don't have to take rhinos, but you can take rhinos. We can do it. Um, but and then also, I would also challenge you to you know what things have you traditionally thought of as limitations that could be repurposed or thought of as assets. Maybe that's a different timing, maybe it's a different use of them, um, but sometimes when we look at inventory, we just look physically at it. We don't necessarily think about different ways um, to to use it, like rhino meat. No, just kidding, just totally kidding. Uh, anyway, so after this, our next, um, our next uh, session is gonna be on March 10th, focused on forage and land, meat, forage needs and land production. Um, and so we're going to be looking at how to do some estimates of what um, is needed, how to look at um, what is being produced, uh, recognizing that not every paddock is going to be the same and the management for them um, is also not going to be, um, you know, necessarily the same for different purposes. And then Try to match the forage, the livestock, and the management all together. Uh, these examples are just examples for me. I know that um, Sam um, and Mahu and um, and our folks, at friends at UMass, are uh, they've got their own proprietary stuff. Um, but this is just basically just to sort of give you a sense of we're going to match all these things together because we have animals that have particular needs and we have land that has particular um, ability to produce. And how are we going to manage those two things together? That will be the next session. And then we always have to think about the seasonal variation. I always want to remind people what works in May is not what works in July, which is not what works in September. We have to always think about that piece too. So that's next next time. And then after that, we'll be focusing on infrastructure and system designs. Um, and you know, just to sort of give you some thoughts about looking. This is that 30,000 foot view that, that Susan was talking about. Um, and what would that actually look like on paper if we were going to design something? What are some things to think about? Um, what is uh, What would we actually design based on our goals, based on the assets that we have? And then um, on April 6th is our final session. And, um, and at that point, we'll be bringing together our plan. And we'll be talking also about refining it and, and what some contingencies might be. And, Contingencies might include managing a summer slump by, you know, could be some planting of annuals, might not be, but thinking about that could be diversifying species. I should have added a rhino into this picture. I'm sorry, I didn't. Um, could be thinking about getting into the animal behavior side of it because we are livestock farmers working with livestock. And so animal behavior can have a really big impact on what our grazing system itself looks like and how it functions. Um, we could be thinking about how we need to manage invasive species or particular challenges that we, things that we want more of or things that we want less of as we um, evolve in our planning. 
or uh, different ways to improve forage quality and quantity, like this example with um, bale grazing on the left, which a year later, two years later, looked like the picture on the right. Um, or we also want to, you know, part of the contingencies, uh, we talked about this a little bit in our in our breakout group, is um, winter, winter season and shoulder seasons, because grazing season, there's a growing season and there's a grazing season, and you can set yourself up for the growing season by managing your non-growing time um, really well. And that could be the shoulder seasons, it could be how you handle winter. Uh, there's lots of different ways, but it should be part of the conversation. What do you do in a drought? What do you do um, in a flood? We have to do. Anyway, so this is the end. I'm gonna turn it back over to Rachel and the group for any questions and um, Thank you all very much. Thanks to the co-presenters as well for being so awesome. Thank you, Jen. Um, and while I'm at it, Damon and Susan as well. Uh, you guys will see all of them back at least once, um, some of them maybe twice or three times. So <laughs> they um, this year, instead of doing, having multiple, uh, speakers per workshop, I stuck with several speakers over several workshops uh, to kind of create that um, cohesive group uh, that, that we're working through. So uh, while I'm wrapping up, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to shoot them off to the, uh, the presenters right now. So certainly put those into the chat box uh, if we've missed anything. I will just take the, the rhino meat um, as a as a joke, and um, we'll, we'll skip right over that. But I do, I, I guess it, it does make you think a little bit about uh, what other kinds of meats are out there, aside from our traditional, um, what we usually think of as, as livestock. So anyways, um, the last thing I do want to mention again, and I will share my screen again, just so that you have her contact information, but, um, Sam Corcoran from UMass is, and I'm, some of you uh, probably saw her up close um, as a leader, but she is our go-to this year um, as part of the Cedar Tree Foundation and the New England Grazing Network. Their goals are to be able to help producers um, and service providers just like you guys um, get that guy that extra guidance and and help that is that you need so reach out to her at any time throughout this series uh, she is more than happy to help uh, i will actually since we do have a minute or so pause and let sam uh, mention any comments if if you would like um, i'd be happy to to take a, a second and and let you have that time I'll just say hello and introduce myself. Um, so as, as Rachel kindly introduced, I'm Sam, I'm at UMass. Um, I'm your, your Southern New England contact. Jen's the real boss of the New England Grazing Network, um, but I'm your point person for uh, Mass, Rhode Island and Connecticut. She's shaking her head no, but she is. Um, but uh, anyways, I'm happy to come out and visit your farm. I work with the, the Livestock Institute, and so we do farm visits and provide support. I also am full-time at UMass. so. No question is too small. If you saw someone say summer slump and you think, I don't know what we're talking about, I'm a safe person. You can ask me. Um, so anytime, yeah, give me a, shoot me an email, uh, give me a call, whatever you need. I'm happy to help. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, so lastly today, before we wrap up, um, oops, I'm just going to actually jump out of here and um, stop sharing. Um, if we can, I just am checking the chat real quick and making sure that there are no missed questions, which it doesn't look like. Um, the last thing that I'd like to just wrap up with today is I know Jen had mentioned that our next webinar is March 10th, but again, March 10th, uh, 10 to 12, we'll be working on a lot of forage calculations. Uh, so, uh, you can expect a pretty similar setup to what we had today, uh, some worksheets going out in advance. So you guys have the ability to, uh, take a look at them and at least review them beforehand. Um, if you have any questions, certainly reach out to me at any time, Jean King, who has been my trusty assistant for some years now and has been here much longer than I have, uh, is always around. So I'm happy to. 
uh, to share with her any questions you have, if she can answer them as well. Uh, otherwise, um, if Mackenzie could just drop a link for the um, uh, post evaluation for our webinar today, that would be great. And um, you guys can go ahead and take that. And uh, aside from that, you can jump off and I'll be in touch uh, as, as it gets a little bit closer to our upcoming webinar on March 10th. Thank you all for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day.